um, through interview and maybe following some like daily activities, kind of on a documentary level to see what it's all about. To kind of um, think it'd be a great way to kind of educate everyone on it. I personally, in the past, like I don't know, few like weeks or so, or just only been that long, have learned a ton about it. The more and more I learn, the more I hear about what everybody's up to, the more I want to learn. So um, I reached out to Regine. I talked to Gene, and he sent me your info. And uh, I just wanted to kind of let you know about it, see if you would be interested in participating. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of my feel. Okay. Uh, cool. Well, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to help any way that I can. Cool. That's great. Um, basically, right now we're just. Um, I'd love to just get to, to tell you just real briefly. I'll just take like 10, 15 minutes of your time, and then I'd love to just do do something a little bit on video, which would just be via Skype, um, which would just be kind of a introduction. How you move? Why you move to Keen? Um, I, and I saw your YouTube, so I know some of this information. Um, and what you've been involved in, why it is your passion, what you guys are doing moving forward, kind of, you know, a day in the life of all that stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I can help with that. <clears throat> so, Wait, so, how old are you now, Derek? I'm 25. You're 25? Okay, so when did you, I'm sorry, maybe I'm not remembering properly, I thought you were so you, you have such a beautiful club. Uh, I thought you were a little bit younger than that. Oh, good, thank you. I moved to Keene in 2011, originally. <clears throat> okay. I was 21 at the time, or uh, just, yep, just about to turn 22, but still 21. And uh, I didn't know anyone here. I moved from Philadelphia, and I stayed in Keene for about a week before reaching out to anyone. I, I went looking for jobs and... Uh, was reading the local paper, just trying to see what it was like um, being an outsider before I became an insider. And uh, that was a good decision, I think. I, I reached out eventually to the activists here by calling the radio show Free Talk Live and telling them that I had moved. Um, it was a bit unconventional in the sense that I didn't sign the statement of intent uh, saying that I was moving. I didn't uh, inform anyone ahead of time. I just went onto Craigslist and found a room and uh, moved without knowing what I was getting into. And then once I was here, I found myself uh, fitting right in uh, at home and uh, making friends with people because we, we had the same values. Well, I wanted to be an outsider first to see <clears throat> what it was like inside Keene from an outsider's perspective, knowing that once I associated with some of the um, people who I had grown to idolize on YouTube videos, that uh, I, I would be biased in a way. So I went around, I was looking for jobs, and people were asking, why did you move to Keene from Philadelphia? And it was hard to answer that question without being <laughs> completely obvious that I, I had moved as, as a part of Free Keen uh, or as a part of the Free State Project or just generally for more freedom. And that's what I would tell them is uh, I, I moved because New Hampshire is a lot freer than Philadelphia. And they seemed to take that uh, and accept it. But often there was a prejudice, I think, against um, outsiders, people who have moved from far away, especially if they've moved with the intention of living more free. For whatever reason, that really turns people off around here. That's strange, okay. <laughs> that doesn't seem okay. Yeah, that's not what I would think either, but um, I think most people resist change no matter what it looks like. Yeah, that was from yeah, that was from when I was Yeah, I was 22 at that time when my victimless crime spree began and um it was shortly after my birthday was was my first arrest. Um 
where I was incarcerated for the crime of video recording inside of City Hall. And that charge was dropped the day before court, but it gave me an interesting first experience with the local bureaucracy here in Keene. Um, gave me a taste that's of what I was in for. Pardon? I'm sorry, that's on the YouTube video, right? Yeah. The yeah, that is... That is covered. All of my arrests are covered in, in my full documentary, Derek J's Victimless Crime Spree. Oh, cool. I love that. That looks hard. Yeah, producing a, a documentary, it, it sure was. Yeah. But I, I think it was worth it because, uh, you know, I post YouTube videos every day and people follow me, but it's hard to remember things that you watched a year ago. So putting it all together in one movie uh, really tells the story a lot better. Oh, thank you. So, uh, yes. <clears throat> Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, well, it does change, you know, values are always changing, and when I moved to Keene, some values that were important to me were firearms freedom, uh, tax freedom, and um, freedom to travel, freedom to record, freedom to uh, imbibe substances of my choice, use my body the way I see fit, for example, smoking pot openly, uh, that was something that inspired me. Because I, I moved to Keene, I could have moved anywhere in the state, but I, I chose Keene because there were other activists who were doing the living free, not begging permission from the state, not running for election, but just living free by ch doing what they wanted, uh, so long as it wasn't infringing on anyone else or hurting anyone, like smoking pot openly. You know, that takes a lot of courage to, to do when you know that you could face some pretty serious penalties for just a, such a simple, innocent action. But I, I feel like it was those people who are willing to live courageously who, who will change the world. And so I wanted to go and reinforce those gutsy activists. So, yeah, while I used to care about uh, cannabis freedom and an end to the drug war, my thoughts and focus have shifted to one single focus, which is the right to record. Uh, you know, of course I'm... <clears throat> beg your pardon? Yeah, um, it, it, I think it, it... Of course, I'm for total human freedom. You know, I, I want complete liberty for all humanity. But uh, it, getting there is going to take several little steps. And one of those steps, I think, is the establishing in everyone's mind the freedom to record. Meaning if you're on if you're on the job, you're on the record. Yeah, I did Robin Hooding in 2011 and 2012. I haven't been as active with it lately um, because it's not m one of my main focuses, but I applaud the work of Robin Hooders whenever I'm out in the, the s s downtown area. I feed parking meters whenever they're expired. Uh, but I'm not one of those named in the lawsuit because it's not something that I engaged in frequently enough. Kind of 
what kind of what has changed in Keene? Hmm. Well, the biggest change that I've seen in Keene as a result of the activism has been a focus on media. The media has shined its spotlight on what's happening here in Keene as a result of the activists chalking, recording, protesting at City Hall, and engaging in other manner of activism. Uh, it's because there are people doing something here um, that anyone is, is paying any attention. I, I think that Keene is not unique. Um, it's not a particularly egregious city government. It's just like every other city government. It's just that no one else is re video recording what's going on in their local government. So if I think if I think if everyone were to do this, they would see just as much corruption, um, just as much insane bureaucracy as we see here in Keene. It's just they're not willing to take the time to go and video record these corrupt bureaucrats. But as you are in New Hampshire, it does bring a certain kind of activist group because of the free state project. I mean, that's not. I mean, I guess I could maybe find, I could find a group probably in Los Angeles, but there are different states that you think that the movement is like certain activists and the libertarianism and things like that are happening as strongly as key. Yeah, the other the other part of that is the concentration of, of activists, though. While you make a great, great point about how you can find government accountability watch groups in almost any area, in Los Angeles, I'm from Philadelphia, we had one there as well, the concentration of the population who is focused on government accountability is much higher here in New Hampshire, uh, with a much lower population in general and a much higher activist population. Um, I think there's more of a public pressure on politicians and other government bureaucrats. So anyone, if you're if you're willing to pick up a video camera in LA and hold your government bureaucrats accountable there, uh, you would be getting more bang for your buck, so to speak, if you were ho to hold that same video camera here in New Hampshire. Yeah, I view places like that as a lost cause. I mean, where do you even begin? Yeah, it's tri it's triage, and and LA is is a bad part of the hospital. I, I would say uh, New Hampshire has has a lot more likelihood of su of surviving. Um, if if we're going to use that analogy, it's it's worth working here because uh, so many other places are a lost cause. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Actually, it's sort of discouraging. But if more people knew about how they could make a change, right? Yeah. Well, that's my yeah. That is my thesis in my documentary. I say in the first few minutes that the problem is not the bureaucrats on high; it's the followers down below. It's people like you and me who go along to get along. We're real. Where the real power lies, and I think it's it's up to us to. Uh, in, invoke that power, but uh, people in um, areas where there's a high population of people but a low population of activists uh, don't have a good chance. Right. Well, 
would you call yourself? Are you a voluntary, a voluntarist? I call myself, I call myself an abolitionist. Okay. Uh, because I, I am for the abolish, uh, the abolishment of slavery. All human slavery must be abolished. It is wrong. It is immoral. It's impractical. Uh, and I want world peace. Made me an activist. I think. I think. Yeah, I think. I think it was uh, having a, a certain level of my Maslow's hierarchy of needs met, and being able to. You know, I had food, shelter. I have my basic needs covered, and I'm able to look outside to the world and see what else I can start to influence for the better. And um, you know, just having a gratitude for the head start that I was given in life made me want to give back and seeing injustices in the world um, really gets to me. So I, I am inspired by the, the quote by Martin Luther King Jr. that uh, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. My dad is uh, very supportive of the work that I've done. It was hard for both of my parents when I went to jail for my activism. My mother is uh, distraught and wishes that I would leave New Hampshire forever and never interact with the activists again. But I think they're both happy that I'm following my heart. They are in the, the Pennsylvania, New Jersey area, yeah. They're, they're both from New Jersey, technically. Oh, interesting question. No, I'm a city boy, and so... Keene was a huge disappointment in many ways uh, because I was I was laughed at when I w asked where the clubs were, and um, the the gay life is lacking, uh, so it's hard to find a partner. But despite all the challenges and the loss of creature comforts, I have found myself more at home than ever before. Uh, you know, when I was away in Philadelphia, I longed for for Keene and. My, my home and my, my family and friends here um, because I, I felt like instantly like I had more of a connection with the people here who I had just met uh, than even my closest friends elsewhere because our conversations didn't center around the weather or, or sports but philosophy and changing the world working towards world peace uh, that's something that I feel like I'm not just wasting my life it's it's worth doing and uh, it, that, that's rewarding Yeah, I, I, I say that I live in Keene in the Shire, and uh, I, okay. I say that I live in Keene in the Shire because um, New Hampshire is just a, a legal fiction. Um, there's, you know, no, no actual lines that are um, between Vermont and Massachusetts and all these other imaginary borders. So when I traveled to Brattleboro, for example, which is in Vermont, or uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts, from Keene, it's only 20 minutes or so. So I consider them all to be part of the Shire. And it's really more of a state of mind anyway. Uh, it's about personal independence, uh, living free, 
living in community with our neighbors, knowing where our food comes from, knowing that we can rely on each other for medical aid or fire emergencies, intruders, whatever the emergency, uh, community interdependence is, is what unites us. I believe we do, uh, and it's not something that any one person has built on his own. I mean, I was one of the things that sold me on the community aspect of New Hampshire before I moved here was seeing a YouTube video of a man who drove around the state helping out his porcupine neighbors who had had a power failure due to extreme weather conditions and he used a portable generator to help them get their lights and electricity and plumbing and everything working again. Uh, did it totally independently, uh, relied on no government or state agency, and uh, did it purely out of the charity and goodwill of his heart. And that's, that's the kind of neighbors I want to be around, and th those are the kinds of people I want to support uh, and be around. <laughs> Oh, uh, porcupine. Yeah, so the porcupine is a symbol to me. Uh, I would consider it something of a spirit animal. It's like a uh, peaceful creature that does its own thing, wants to be left alone, and um, it's more trouble than it's worth to, to go after and it's an attack. Um Yeah, I I can Porcupines, yeah, they're friendly, they're social creatures. They play. Yes. No, I am uh, self-employed through blogging and broadcasting. I do podcasts and vodcasts. I host a Bitcoin talk show once a week uh, for three hours, live call-in show broadcast over Google Hangouts every Wednesday called Bitcoin Talk Show at bitcointalkshow.com. I do uh, well, Monday nights on Free Talk Live, a nationally syndicated radio show on 152 stations across the U.S. Um, and on Sundays and Tuesdays, like tonight, I'll be broadcasting my podcast, Peace News Now. It's a two-hour long-form live call-in show centered around stories of peaceful resistance. So anywhere in the country or the world where people are standing up against arbitrary authority, I want to be there to cover it. So I've, I've traveled to Wisconsin to cover the story of a raw milk farmer who was being prosecuted for the crime of selling raw milk, um, all the way to D.C. Um, for Lemonade Freedom Day, where children set up shop on the lawn of the Capitol building and vended lemonade criminally. Yeah, there's lots of things that are crimes, but they don't involve any victim. And I'd like to focus on those because the more um, people know about them and um, complain, hopefully prosecutors will find it in their best interest to leave those types of people alone. So what, are you part of the talking at all? Is that a big deal or not really a big deal? What is your perspective on it? Hmm. It's kind of a victimless crime, isn't it? Chalking is definitely a victimless crime. <laughs> I I, I recent I recently spoke I recently spoke on this issue before the Keene City Council 
they were taking public comment about the issue, I asked the council to consider that chalk is a natural substance that uh, forms on its own out of the earth, and humans have been using chalk and chalk-like products on cave walls since the dawn of time. It's unlikely that written language would exist without humans using chalk in some capacity in our history, and it's just as important today that a human's right is preserved to speak their mind freely uh, without fear or threats that they'll be caged for expressing themselves, especially in a, in a peaceful way. I'm not talking about interpretive dance with knives. I'm, I'm talking about using chalk on the ground or, or on a, even on a monument. Um, I, don't, I don't see a, a um, property rights violation there, so long as the monument is public property. It's, it's owned by everyone, isn't it? So we, we all have an equal right to um, express ourselves in, in public places. Is it something that's still going on, or is it something of the past, or is it... Yeah, to... Is it an altercation at the beginning of the month, but I don't know if that maybe dispelled any sort of... It's definitely... It's definitely still going on. I see people from the town who stop by the local activist center and will drop off donations of boxes of chalk. Uh, today, I received a donation of some stencils in the shape of a peace sign, a heart, and a smiley face, and those were intended to be used with chalk. So it's still very active, and it's not just activists per se who are participating, but local townspeople have also gotten involved. And so I think it's become an issue of uh, those who are for free speech and those who are against it. It's pretty simple. That's okay. I was hoping to, <laughs> I, I find it, this is all such a great kind of education and learning experience for me, like a new topic, and so, um, uh, what I'm hoping to do is to, uh, to kind of Skype with you, and I know that you're not available at all tomorrow, um, is there be a time on Thursday that would make sense for you? Yeah, um. And I would, mean, it'll be like 20, 30 minutes, and it's basically an introduction to you. Um, why you moved to Keen, what you found in Keen, you know, uh, unlawful kind of arrest, why you do what you do. And probably, I, I didn't even talk about it, but the, the people who are doing stop free Keen, I don't even know if that's really that active or something. I know it's just kind of a Facebook page. But it's a real thing. It it's a real thing. It's also a blog. And I'm flattered by Stop Free Keen because I have many followers on Facebook and on YouTube, but... No one is as thorough as the haters at Stop Free Keen. Uh, they watch everything uh, closely and re report on it. If there's a, a typo or any sort of mistake, uh, they're there to hold me accountable. So I, I appreciate their vigilance. But uh, Thursday, the best time for me would be sometime probably around noon or 1 o'clock. Uh, I'll be participating in some activism that morning, handing out some flyers at the local courthouse, encouraging people okay. to not take a plea deal. I'll also be attending a trial for a friend of mine named Joe who received a parking ticket, and he's contesting that. Should be interesting to see. Okay. Um, I think it's always worth it to contest those tickets. Um, if they're going to take your money and find you guilty anyway, might as well make them work for it. Wow, yeah. So you have a lot less at stake here in New Hampshire. Yeah, often in places like LA, it costs money to contest the ticket, sometimes more than the cost of the ticket itself. I, it actually makes me walk a lot more. Because once I park my car, 
car in a good spot, I'm really not going to drive it that much. <laughs> hmm. If I'm in a place, so I don't know. But I, when I heard that, it, oh God, it just it hurts my heart. Yeah, um, r- humans respond to incentives, and I would like those incentives to be peaceful and voluntary rather than uh, coercive and extortive like the, the ones you're yeah. describing. I just wish you were walking because you wanted to be, you know, or not because you're you're afraid of threats. Right. You know what? And that that is true. I'm trying to spin it positive glass half full because that's just I try to think of things in a positive manner. Um, but yeah, you're right. You're right. Like I when I saw what you guys were doing, that it it has me somewhat of a difference. Yeah. <laughs> well, for one, they haven't been able to replace the meter maid that they lost. Uh, one meter maid quit. He was actually a soldier in Iraq, and he found it hmm, tougher to be a meter maid in Keene, New Hampshire. So that'll tell you something. Uh, he. So they haven't been able to replace that person. Um, Despite that, they still have a full-time, five-day-a-week manager for the other two employees. Um, they're all paid many tens of thousands of dollars a, a week. But no, I, I can't. I, I don't think anything with um, parking or ticketing has changed. It's just that they haven't collected as many tickets. Uh, they they don't write as many. They can't write as many because there are fewer expired parking meters. They've yeah, they, they've said that they don't want the Robin Hooders following them and that they, they follow a route, but Robin Hood has asked for their route so that he could specifically avoid them, and, and they won't give one. So it, it just seems like they um, they don't know what to do. And uh, mm-hmm. that's, that's I, I just want to see a city where people can park and not feel threatened that their car will be towed uh, because they spend an extra five minutes in a restaurant or something. There has to be more of a common sense solution than towing people's cars um, for a crime that involves no victim. Well, maybe think. So that's cool. That's the whole thing. Okay. It is cool, and uh, that's something that's something uh, that I should mention for choosing Keene. I, I mentioned I'm a city guy, and yeah, more people in the U.S. now live in cities than live in the suburbs, but something's unique about the way that Keene is in any town USA. I said there's nothing unique about the, the city government. They're just as corrupt as anyone else. Uh, and if it can work in Keene, I feel like it can work anywhere. So it's sort of a test bed for activism, like, oh, is the chalking thing good? Is, is the topless gun-carrying thing good? You know, and is the, um, fr- is this a good way to present? Oh, <laughs> well, yep, yeah, that was another thing that happened here. But uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't so popular, or, you know, it, it, it draws a different kind of crowd, draws different attention. Uh, I, I think it's a, an interesting test bed for activism so that people can watch the YouTube videos and see, hey, that worked pretty well. I want to try that where I live. And people have done that. Yeah, yeah no, it's really cool. What a cool talk about, you know what I mean? Um, so, if, so I'm, this is a little bit off topic, but I'm just going to add one more question. I'm sorry, I know we're scheduling things, but how do you think that the town feels about um, the activism? Are most of them positive about it, or I mean, they take different pictures in the press. How do, how do you feel about it? Like, when, are people against it? When they see you, do they get upset? Or for the most part, are they for it? Or fifty-fifty? Or hmm. Well, when I moved to Keene, and I wasn't an activist yet, I asked the person with whom I moved in what do you know about the, the free Keen people or the, the free state project people? And she said, 
No, they're harmless. She was she's an older woman who's lived in this New Hampshire region for her entire life. And she said the thing that's great about New Hampshire is that people can so vehemently disagree with each other and that's part of our culture, that it's it's part of the public discourse to have disagreements, to go to the public square, to hash out serious issues. It's the reason during all the elections everyone has their eyes focused on New Hampshire first, that's that and the primary. But the um, culture of the town, from my perspective, has been pretty much what that first woman described to me. She said, she just doesn't care. It's not part of her day-to-day -day life. If she encountered some video, she would probably have an opinion on it because people in New Hampshire are opinionated, but it's not that it's something she gives a lot of time and attention to on her day-to-day -day activities. I think most townspeople just want to live their life. Thursday, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Works for me great. Okay, great. I can, you can, if that doesn't work, I can do another time, but you're good between after 12 or 1 o'clock. I can do one Thursday, whatever works. Yeah, uh, it, one never knows how long a trial is going to go, but a traffic ticket typically doesn't take too long. Uh, that should give me enough time to return and uh, take your call. That'll be over Skype? Yeah, that'll be over Skype. Okay. I can be ready for that. Yeah. Cool. And the only thing I would ask is if you don't mind being in a place with a uh, strong internet connection, just so that it doesn't get all fuzzy or pixelated. Yeah, I'm in my studio right now, so I'll be broadcasting from my studio at Peace News Now Studios uh, here in Kiev. And then good lighting. Yep, yep. I have, uh, this is where I broadcast from, so I'll, I'll have my professional lights and background and, uh, professional microphone, everything all set up. That's where actually where I'm broadcasting from now. I'm, I'm recording this call on uh, audio and video. Okay, cool. Um, okay, uh, are, are you also, I wanted to know kind of what your schedule was next week. Uh, next week I'm pretty free. I just have a standard work week. I'll be doing podcasts and radio shows throughout the week. Um, but my freest day is Thursday. Um, okay, great. So if you'd like to just follow you in some of the group, I know you guys have different meetings and things like that. Yeah. Will folks be in town, you mean? Um, which I'm trying to figure out just to get uh, a crew together and see what schedules are like and things like that. So okay. So I was wondering when things were happening and we're just going to kind of document. So. Sure. Yeah. So I do... Um, Free Talk Live on Monday from 7 to 10. Uh, I'm going to be doing my late night show, Peace News Now, from 10 to midnight on Tuesday. And then I do another show uh, that's super late night from 1 to 3 a.m. called Freedom Fiends. Uh, then Bitcoin Talk Show is Wednesday, 3 to 6 p.m. I'll be doing Don't Take the Plea Deal Outreach on Thursday where I hand out flyers to people at the courthouse. Friday, I do a show called The Bitcoin Group. So I have time. I have free time in each of those days, and I have some activism time every day as well. So there should be something for you to get. Okay, great. So I'll just, um, uh, I'll just keep it, I'll talk to you, touch base with you on Thursday, and I will be in touch with you and kind of email you to kind of figure out scheduling as I kind of pinpoint stuff. Okay, very cool. You can email me anytime. Uh, I respond pretty quick. All right, thank you. It's Margaret, right? It is Margaret. All right, thank you so much, Margaret. All right, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, All right, that was pretty cool. Sounds like uh, this person's interested in what's happening in Keene. I hope I can be helpful. I tried to answer as honestly and eloquently as possible. Of course, I could always word things better, but... This is the best I can do right now. Hopefully you found it enlightening.